Sixty dollars for a bottle of wine? What could possibly make a wine worth that much money? And a little trip down to Southern California wine regions. All that and so much more on this episode of The Average Wine Enthusiast. Hi there, everybody. My name is Mike LaPlante, and I'm the average wine enthusiast. You know, a question I get all the time is why some wine is more expensive than other wine, like ridiculously expensive, 50, 60, up to $100 per bottle. Well, oftentimes I say it's the expertise that goes in to making those bottles of wine. Of course, there's other factors, wine made in California is going to be more expensive because real estate is more expensive there. The cost to buy anything to run a business, let alone live in California, makes it so that things are more expensive. But oftentimes, the reason a bottle of wine is so expensive is because of the expertise that went in to making that bottle of wine. And oftentimes, the price correlates to the quality and the taste of the wine. Of course, there's other factors. Vintage comes to mind as well. The older wine gets, the better it gets. And the better wine is, the more you can uh, charge for that bottle of wine. So what is this expertise? Well, people who make wine do so in all different manners of uh, the way they go about making the wine. So you have a mom and pop operation where the way they make the wine is the way they made wine that has been a recipe that's been passed down year after year if if this situation happens you do this if this situation happens you do this in other operations you have people who don't really even know what they're doing believe it or not they go in thinking they can make wine and oftentimes the results are somewhat disastrous or just plain meh so there's that situation. But if you have a winemaker who really knows what they're doing, uh, one that has probably studied abroad, went to different areas of the world and see how they make wine, go to school and see how, you know, how to really make wine and all the science that's really involved, that expertise, like in any field, costs money. So oftentimes it's that expertise that... Um, is the factor that makes a bottle of wine very expensive. Part of that expertise, of course, is what to put in wine to make it do what it's got to do to be a, a yummy bottle of wine, right? So that's what I'm going to talk about on this episode, is the stuff that's put into wine that makes it what it is. So first off, there is antiseptics and antioxidants. Antiseptics, of course, that you don't want organisms growing in your wine, uh, stuff that can make you sick or make the wine go bad. So oftentimes this is in the form of sulfites. There is sulfites in every single wine that's on a shelf somewhere. If there wasn't, you'd have to drink it almost immediately before you know it started going bad. So Sulfites is one of them. Uh, there's sulfur dioxide, potassium bisulfite, potassium metabulosulfate, and absorbic acid, which has vitamin C in it. Another reason why wine is so good for you. Um, another thing that helps make it uh, clean, a clean product to drink, is uh, filtration. This uh, eliminates uh, microorganisms and removes sediments and clarifies the wine. There's uh, Charcoal filtration, cross flow microfiltration, and flash pasteurization. So, knowing how to do all these things to your wine is something that is beneficial to any bottle of wine. Then there's fermentation nutrients, um, these are used to help yeast ferment. And then there's that's another expertise thing right there. You want your wine to have a certain um, alcohol by volume, well, that is going to determine which yeast that you use to uh, ferment your grapes. 
if you didn't know, that's how that's how alcohol is made. Uh, grapes have sugar in them. You put yeast in there. The yeast eats the sugar, and the byproduct, of course, is alcohol. So, uh, active dry yeast, uh, diammonium phosphate, ammonium pho uh, sulfate, thiamine, yeast bark, uh, enzyme uh, preparations. These are all fermentation nutrients. Things that help your yeast turn your must into alcohol uh, then there's fining and clarification uh, this what makes your wine clear you don't want stuff floating around in your wine you don't want cloudy wine you want it to be clear uh, so they add uh, ising glass casing plant proteins egg albumin cologne silicon dioxide tannins yeast protein extract bentonite uh, and a lot of other chemicals just for fining and clarification. Then there is organoleptic management. This is used to control flavor and the taste profile. This is really where the expertise of making a really yummy bottle of wine comes into uh, play. There's lactic acid bacteria. The amount that you use will determine exactly what uh, flavors will be brought out in your wine. Also, uh, oak barrels, of course. Oak is one of those things that uh, is going to affect the flavor. Some people put oak chips into the into the wine to make it uh, add a certain uh, flavor profile to it as well. And uh, lysozyme. A lot of these things I can't even pronounce. <laughs> but that's another... Uh, chemical that is put in there to alter the flavor of the wine. Like I said, expertise knowing exactly how to uh, put the additives in. Uh, and then there's stabilization, very important process in winemaking. Uh, potassium hydrogen tartrates, uh, yeast, uh, manoproteins, uh, marta tartactic acids, and a lot of really big words that I can't even pronounce. Uh, but one of the last one that uh, is used for stabilization is cold stabilization, which a lot of wineries are unable to do just because of their location. Uh, it would cost a lot to, um, you know, have a, a refrigeration system for, you know, large vats of wine. So they use different uh, methods for stabilization. So that is... Uh, common additives that are uh, that assist in standard winemaking then there is corrective additives so there's things that go on when you crush a grape uh, too much sugar not enough sugar too much acid not enough acid uh, and I'll go through those now uh, there's polyphenol management which uh, stabilizes color and reduces astringency so there's potassium cassinate uh, gum Arabic, Arabic and also cold stabilization also affects the poly polyphenol management. I know this is like a, a science class, but these are things that you begin to realize that you need to be somewhat of a scientist to make wine uh, or a lab technician, which uh, a lot of wineries hire out labs to come in and do their lab work for them. Uh, they just give them, you know, what they think they want and the lab does the work for them. So they hire out expertise. It's not really a hands-on kind of thing, which I think is um, can be good, but then it, it also, uh, you relinquish the power uh, to somebody else and hopefully they do a good job and they know what they're doing. Uh, hydrogen sulfide corrects bad aromas and tastes from hydrogen sulfide and derivatives. You open up a bottle of wine sometimes and it has a whoo smell. That's uh, from the use of hydrogen sulfide, which oftentimes by decanting you can uh, get rid of that. Uh, then there's enrichment, which uh, grapes do not have enough concentration of uh, uh, sugar. So you uh, do something called chapitalization, adding sugar. Uh, concentrated grape must you add that um, reverse osmosis and evaporative enrichment 
then there's the opposite of uh, enrichment, and that's de-enrichment. Uh, when grapes are too sweet to make dry wine, so you, you add water. Add too much water, you screwed it up. Expertise, money. Re and of course, reverse osmosis will neutralize as well. Then there's acidification. Uh, when grapes do not have enough acid to produce uh, a stable wine, they add tartaric acid, lactic acid, malic acid, and they also perform electrodialysis to uh, boost the uh, acidification. Then there's grapes that are too acidic, they uh, will add lactic acid bacteria, potassium bicarbonate, and calcium carbonate as well. So those are corrective additives. So I, I just went through a dozen things, did a dozen different categories of things that you can do to wine that I, I don't understand half of them myself and how they work and, and the effect they have on a bottle of wine. But you can see that Someone who really knows their stuff can make a bottle of wine that tastes awesome by um, using these techniques to uh, make a good bottle of wine. And then there's the whole thing of blending. You know, you can have a, a, a bottle of wine here in North America that you can call a Pinot Noir or call a Cabernet Sauvignon. And it only has to be 75% of that one variety of grape. The other 25% can be anything, any other varietal that you want to put in there to make it um, taste a very specific way. So there's that expertise too, that blending expertise. You put a little bit of Cinso or a little bit of Morvedre or other blending grape into your um, varietal and it uh, turns it into something else altogether. Okay, enough with the science class already. Uh, before I go, I wanted to tell you about a, a little trip that uh, my wife and I made. We went to California to uh, a couple of different wine regions. Now, of course, people know uh, Napa Valley and Sonoma, uh, uh, very well-known wine regions in California. But uh, my wife and I went down to Southern, Southern California and we visited two wine regions there. Uh, the first, well, first we flew into San Diego and we went to a wine region known as Temecula. Uh, it's a very picturesque area. It was beautiful weather while we were there as well. Uh, as often is the case in Southern California. And uh, they have, I don't know, maybe 40 different wineries in this area. And the wine that uh, comes out of there is very hit and miss, something like the area that I live in. Uh, I find that uh, oftentimes these wineries don't often know what they're doing. It. They haven't really, um, they're not really playing to their strengths. What I find is a lot of wineries out in the Temecula area, uh, they don't do just wine. They're a bed and breakfast, or they're a spa, or they're a, a resort of some kind. And the majority of the wineries out there um, really play up the um, availability of wedding facilities, which, you know, that's, that's just another part of the business. You have a banquet hall and you have wine there. Of course, you can do both of those things in one location. And uh, it's, it's a good business plan, but there it, it, they take it almost to a, a, another level, really. Um, one of the places that we went to, Mount Palomar, which is, I believe, the highest peak in the Temecula area, that offers some amazing views. And they have some really good wine there. I have to admit that place was uh, uh, offered wine that was very good. But again, it was super pricey, uh, $60, $70 US for a bottle of wine. That's way out of my uh, price range. And uh, the area on Mount Pal Pal Palomar, where this uh, winery was, uh, you walk up some stairs and to, to get to this high elevation where the, I guess the views are spectacular. But the day we were there, um, we couldn't go up there because there was a wedding rehearsal going on. So if you went there to go check out the views at Mount Palomar, sorry, you're not going up there because... This other business that we have is not allowing you to go up there. That kind of turned me off. But the place was nice. Very nice facilities. Really good wine. Live music. Uh, really nice people. Um, Mount Palomar. I would, I would recommend going for a tasting there. And that's another thing. Tastings in Temecula. Um, it costs money. You, you cannot taste there uh, without paying some money. I think we went to one winery while we were there. 
that uh, if you spent, I forget what it was, 50, 60, 70 dollars. If you spent a certain, uh, went over a certain amount, uh, if you bought a certain amount of wine from them, they would um, forego the tasting fee. So there was that. Um, uh, there was some wineries you walk in and um, you tell them you're there for a tasting and they want the money right up front. Okay, we, you're here for a tasting. That'll be twenty dollars. So that kind of, that kind of turned me off. That's it was more. It, it wasn't you know a, a pleasant winery uh, experience. A tasting. You know you're just in there. You're, you might as well just be hunkering up to a bar somewhere and uh, and going for a glass of wine. So yeah, the Temecula, they got they got some work to do as far as being a legitimate wine region. Uh, so from there, uh, well, we bypassed, uh, we took a little detour up to Joshua Tree National Park, beautiful area of the world, I have to admit, and it's in the desert. If you get an opportunity to go out that neck of the woods, I highly recommend it. Uh, but uh, once we left there, we went to Santa Barbara, which is uh, a, a legit uh, wine uh, region. Uh, that is where they filmed the movie Sideways, uh, starring Paul Giamatti, which some people, like I've said in a previous episode, some people think I look like him. Um, and there, uh, we'll, we didn't stay in Santa Barbara, where they grow the grapes for the Santa Barbara wine region is in the area of uh, Los Alamos and Solvang. But we stayed in a little town called Santanez, um, just outside of Los Alamos. We stayed in an Airbnb there. Uh, but this is right in the heart of the vineyards that make up the Santa Barbara uh, wine area, which was, it was cool to be in. And the, the drive up there was spectacular. Um, you, you, you can't get these kind of views, I don't think, anywhere else. Lots of uh, mountains and uh, vineyards. Just breathtaking views, for sure. And the wine there is spectacular, too. You can get some really delicious wines. Again, you're going to be paying some money. Uh, and But the winery experience, fortunately, we had some people who, uh, who live in the L.A. area, actually. And they gave us recommendations to go to very specific wineries, which I love that. You, you get some recommendations and you kind of stay away from the places that, you know, you might be wasting time because you only have so much time in these places. And someone gives you a recommendation, go with it. And uh, that's what we did. And uh, we weren't sorry that we did either because the, the experience was uh, beautiful. The wine was awesome. The people that were there that were there were awesome. And it was uh, exactly what we were looking for. One of the places we went to in uh, Santa Barbara was uh, Zaca Mesa, a uh, very nice winery there. I also bought a bottle of uh, this Belvino. This was in the Temecula area. This was the only bottle that I brought from the Temecula area. It was in my price range, <laughs> let's just say that. But there was a wine that I had in um, Temecula that was really good. It was a crazy blend, like seven different uh, grape varieties that were in the wine and it was made by a wine uh, winery called South Coast but um, when we went and visited another winery in Temecula it was called Somerset we, and we got a nice tour from the owner there but he really dissed South Coast South Coast winery even though that was one of the best wines that I sampled and we bought it at a um, we bought the South Coast wine, this crazy blend wine. We bought it at a, um, a Binnie's, which is, you know, an awesome beverage, big box store. And I went and, and I talked to somebody in the store because I said I want to buy some local wine. And she gave us the impression that a lot of the wineries in Temecula don't want to sell to retail um, locations in Temecula because uh, it, it lessens their brand. I don't know. The business decisions they're making there in Temecula with their wine is, uh, I don't know. I say they don't really know what they're doing. But one of the one that does is South Coast. I suspect they're the biggest because that's why this guy at Somerset kind of dissed them. But uh, we also uh, went to Belvino and uh, we bought uh, this bottle here from Temecula. And uh, it was very good. This is a 2014 
the, the vintages that were offered at that Binnie's of local wine were out of this world. I think we got a 2013 while we were there. And uh, they weren't expensive at all. I didn't pay more than 25 bucks for a bottle of wine while I was there. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so we went to Zaca Mesa. We also went to Foxen while we were in uh, the Santa Barbara area. And that was also a really good winery. They had the, uh, they kept the original, um, it a, it's a shack basically, where they um, have a tasting room. But they only let you taste uh, certain wines in the shack. And then they also have a, you know, a more modern, larger facility uh, next door um, where they serve a whole different um, classes of, of wine up there, which I thought that was kind of interesting. If, if, you know, if you're interested in Pinots and Chardonnays, you'd had to go to the one place. And if you wanted Cabernet Sauvignons and Merlots, you had to go to the other place. So it was kind of interesting that they, they kept it separate, uh, but it wasn't based on the experience. So I, I suspect that's what they started selling and growing there at Foxen was the Cabernet Sauvignons and the Merlots, it, if that's even the way it went. Uh, but it was one of those varietals. You know, you get you drink and taste so many different wines. You, it's hard for me to remember exactly what the shack offered as opposed to the, the new modern facility over there at Foxen. So we brought a case home uh, from California again, and uh, we were lucky enough that we got through uh, the border here going from the States into Canada. I pulled up there and uh, he didn't ask us where we were or how long we were away. He just asked us if we had anything to declare. And uh, I said I had a case of wine and he gets his pad out like he's going to pull us over and you're going to have to pay duty or whatever you pay taxes on this wine. But then uh, I think he realized that we had been gone uh, on a wine vacation of sorts to California. And uh, he asked us for a receipt. And I said, you know, I, I don't have a receipt for the wine. I, we just visited different wineries and bought a bottle here, bought a bottle there. And uh, and he put his pad away. So we got through the border without having to pay any extra, which, you know, that's a that's a big relief. There's no sense in, you know, adding another 60 to $90 onto your case of wine just because uh, some government wants some taxes. Well, I guess that's going to do it for this episode uh, of The Average Wine Enthusiast. If you know anybody who uh, is digging wine as much as you are that you're watching a YouTube video on wine, uh, let them know about the show. I would really appreciate it. Uh, if you have any comments, leave them down below. Please subscribe. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Uh, till then, I'm Mike LaPlante, and I'm the average wine enthusiast. Salute! <laughs>